Hi everyone, my name is Anderson. Mm, I research about the difficult and challenges faced by the population, black populations in the city of the Recife. At the beginning of the Brazilian Republic period, I analyzed the place of occupation of these black population and their social relation the existing conflict and how these populations live it, understand everyday uh, circumstances within a context of modern, within white, within progress and other. Um, freedom didn't mean equality. After the abolition of slavery in Brazil, this was a reality present in the lives of former slavers and their descendants. The social structures at the beginning of the Republic continued today the inequal structures of the black population and the relationship equis period by this population was still marked by a rare article logic in which blacks represent the base of the Brazilian social structures. Brazil, Brazil was the last subjected country in the Americans to abolition slavery in the, its territory in 1888. This process, this, this, this process was the result of a lot of popular where for sure and the author of the black movement to bring about the uh, abolition of slavery in the post abolition period in Brazil. The black population was still subjected uh, to a social structure that De demand it exists at this moment, these transitions, it is important to emphasize it, that racial territories were still operating within the Brazilian social space and delimiting groups and individual based on scientists' uh, acceptance. Social inequality was a fog factor that is present in the Republic period, cousin claims by the Black population regarding their learned breeding and citizenship, which was limited, everyday life was marked and continues to be by a strangles to conquer these rights. The Brazilian state didn't implement measures for the insertions of former and disliked people and their descendants in the nascent re republic. And with that, the social place of this popular horizon uh, for captivity were still defended by subalterning and marginalization positions. Their civil rights within this scenario was culturally all the con uh, continent of recent equality generation in the law didn't mean an equalization between the subjects, nor the elimination of the exigent social exclusion and the prejudice desterian during this period of uh, captivity. In this sense, the black population is the immediate aftermath of abolition is still queried the market of post-abolition slavery from the previous political system. In this way, the situations of freedom was continued by the permanence 
of remnants of the enslaved men mentally with a social structural still gated by a vertical perspective in which African descendants occupied the base of this social pyramid. Historians Flavio dos Santos Gomes and the Olivia uh, da Cunha realized uh, for the Brazilian post abolition period a weakened citizenship present among the Black population as a result of the maintenance of the rare article values of a re recent past. The authors pointed out that Black people in this period can be seen as a qualitative citizen who would be a person who many time tired to adapt it to the standards established by social society at the time, but never managed to assess all the right gathering uh, get, get by law. This way due to this exercise of a social imbalance that for no white met materials among other ways through the lim limitation of access to political and legal prerogatives introduced by the Brazilian state. Choose when working with this category of uh, what, what is it, citizen Gomes and Cunha talk about the situations of these individuals in the post abolition period, relying this incomplete citizenship that was physical and symbolic marks for the slavery past, the ordering also listed the multiple difficulties faced by the subject market by social origin and color. The, for the exercise of the citizenship condition, sure as the no inclusion in the labor market and the lack of public policies that promised the insertion of the social group. Therefore, space and limits were already demarcated by IY is laboring a little in the past. And now in this Republic, this was no different. Social mechanism were made in the order to guarantee the bordering between classes to compare the social inclusion of this black population within the cruel society. As for the aspect of civilizationship, there are many interpretations that on has is in is harder. In our research, it was possible to perceive how the interpretation about citizenship changed in the period of the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. When analyzed the 1824 constructions, we can observe that were worth the Brazilian citizens and that there was a fixed destination between citizens. In the 1891 construction, this piet the Republican commitment to equality and modernity in practice, many prevails ready with the maintenance and division of extant social group. The social structure was even more restrictive than the previous ones 
and it is including beggars and Ali Rowan's foreign citizenship. Within this scenario, the black population that come from captivity was one of the groups affected by this lack of social participation, often with now ever, no ever to go and with little or no education, many former and enslaved people and their descendants were private of the equality guaranteed by the 19th and by the 1891 constructions. This time is, is the nascent republic, the civilization process of the Brazilian uh, elites inspired by European principles uh, tarred to undertake mensuries of uh, reorganizations and social has has structuring in order to control the free man at that time, as it was believed that they were individual who were unprepared for life uh, in society. Slavery hard not giving these men and women and notion of justice, of respect for property or freedom. The ruling is trade thought that this population brought with it the vice of these province states. They had had no ambition to do good and weren't civilization enough to become full citizens in a few months. In the order to understand this universe of the black population in Recife, as well as its social condition in these first two de decades of the 20th century, it was necessary to seek some studies to support our discussions. At first, works by authors who reflected on the condition of the black population in the Brazilian post abolition period were used in order to understand the social these distances of this newly acquired citizenship. We observed that racism is constructed as a social a structural of the Brazilian population. Beginner worked on the historiographical studies of the post abolition post abolition period, lines of analysis in different fields of knowledge. Knowledge point out that Brazilian racial dis discrimination didn't emerge in the post abolition period, but read there where date that period. Its performance can be seen from the column and the empire. Thus, re regulation the social position of each individuals within the country. In the case of post-abolition, racism continued at act in the Brazilian social structure, which at that time was Republican. Historian Bamira de Albuquerque stated that Black people continued to be far from power space, having their action monitored and constructed by the us, us and the states. In this way, they understand of racism existence within the Brazilian social field constructs and important tool for the percept perceptation on prejudice on intolerance against the black population. Through content analysis, 
we seek to identify the circumstance of involvement of this construction of ration. We seek to- Sorry to this... interrupt, Anderson. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we request you to wrap up your, the 15 minutes are over. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anderson. Uh, our next presentation uh, is by uh, Katarina Lopez Codro from the University of Sao Paulo, uh, Masters of uh, Law LLM at the School of Ribeiro Preto of University of Sao Paulo. Uh, they're also an editorial assistant at the Brazilian Journal of Empirical Legal Studies. Um, they're also associated with the Social Legal Studies Association and the Brazilian Network of um, Empirical Legal Studies. Uh, thank you, Katrina. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry, we can can't hear me? <laughs> Sorry, I was talking with without the microphone. <laughs> can you good. hear me? This is good. This is good. It's okay? Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you for that, Rudy. Um, well, my name is Katarina, and today I'm going to present the paper Decent Work, ILO Convention 189, and Specific Characteristics of Domestic Work, a Case Study of the Brazilian uh, National Workers' Health Policy. So my research goal is to develop a case study to identify if the Brazilian National Workers' Health Policy contemplated the specific characteristics of domestic work, indicating the possible correlation with decent work promotion strategies. This is a part of my master thesis that I um, have already concluded. So the methodological aspects, uh, I divided this paper in two, into two parts. Um, the first one is a theoretical one in which I performed a literature review. And the other one is the empirical part for which I developed some documentary research and also the interviews. So in the literature review, um, we begin with uh, the historical trajectory of exclusions that can be identified uh, in the main labor law instruments adopted in the 40 and 80s uh, that excluded the domestic workers of them. Uh, like, for example, the consolidation of labor law that remains as the main instrument until today. This exclusion was evidenced in the Federal Constitution of 100, uh, 1988 uh, that uh, has a huge section of social rights for home, urban and also rural workers and exclude most of them of domestic workers. Uh, also in the literature review, oops, also, in the literature review, uh, we could then find that even with the historical trajectory of exclusions, domestic workers and these are present since the 30s, where they they were structured like associations. And the change for union entities happened with the national constitution. Um, also, we have, uh, it's important to say about the main um, nowadays instruments of domestic work, like ILO Convention 189 and the Recommendation 201. Um, it's actually important to mention that the union entities of Brazil, especially the federation named FENATRAD, had a significantly participation in the legislative process that culminated into those ILO instruments. Uh, this uh, legislative process uh, also identified in the law and practice report uh, the specific characteristics of domestic workers and also intend to um, integrate them into those uh, adopted instruments. Uh, the specific characteristics are like the personal aspects of the employee, which uh, related to the sexual division of labor and the employee. Uh, also the origin of this work, uh, the migrant work, the work in the environment and others. 
Uh, also, it's possible to identify at the ILO Brazil and ILO Brazil and Brazil ILO dialogue, in which the internal movements and changes, especially in the legislative process and also the mobilization of those entities, are influenced and also influence the ILO legislative process. This can be identified in the constitutional amendment of 2013 and also the complementary law of 2015. Even if they had been adopted later, the main discussions had influence in the ILO process and they were happening prior to the ILO convention number 189. Uh, the constitutional amendment expanded a lot of social rights of domestic, for domestic workers in the co co federal constitution and also the complementary law regulated them. I highlight the health and safety right since the constitutional amendment provide uh, the right to reduction of risks in terms of health and safety for workers and the complementary law was silent about them. Moving on to the ratification of ILO Convention number 189, Brazil faced difficulties since its first steps for that in 2012 and the final ratification in 2018. It's important to say that the ratification does not mean the internalization, which can be identified as a strategy to promote decent work. Those strategies can be political or normative, and in Brazil, they dialogue with that. The structuration for decent work promotion in Brazil is based on the national agenda, uh, the plans, and also a unique conference that happened in 2012. In this conference, there was a concern with uh, workers' health and its structuration in a policy. This happened in the same years with the Brazilian National Workers' Health Policy um, that intends to gather and also to strengthen the initiatives of SUS, that's our National Unified Health System, um, named Sistema Unico de Saúde, SUS, to all workers, with a direct mention to domestic work. So, uh, here is where I begin my empirical part. I performed a documentary research with mainly the material produced by the, uh, the institutions that are integrated to the Brazilian national policy and also the legal instruments. Also, I performed some interviews. Uh, there were six with both representatives of domestic worker unions and also of the representatives of this policy. Uh, I tried to uh, contact the representatives of the domestic workers employers, uh, but I didn't have a return. <laughs> so um, I performed those interviews with a semi-structured um, um, approach and also I performed a data analysis by using the framework of Hobart uh, in. So in the empirical part, I firstly, I, I saw a difference between the statistical data and also the interviews. Uh, in the statistical data, there were like 27 cases in the Sao Paulo state, which um, has the most quantity uh, of union entities of domestic workers. And also um, during the period of 2021 to 2011. So I have identified 25 cases of issues by mental health, for example. In the interviews, for instance, even if I interviewed just three union you know, entities, all of them reported um, that the health health, uh, mental health is also uh, the main um, the main object when it comes to health in of domestic workers. So it's interesting to realize that maybe this group is not coming to the uh, health and other bodies of the state. So also I could identify difficulties of accessing this group and also of this group 
is accessing the, the state bodies. Uh, when I was interviewing the representatives of the policy, uh, they actually mentioned a hardcore of workers that are achieved. And this hardcore is also uh, the formal workers from industries and also with other um, that are part of sectors that are most traditional. So how to manage the specific characteristics of domestic work, like the personal aspects and also the working environment. That is like home for one and also is a workplace for another one. So uh, I also asked about the influence of ILO Convention 189, and all of them mentioned that they already knew the convention, but it was not something that they use. Uh, they mentioned an operational difficulty and also a distance from reality when we are, were talking about the international labor standards and those international norms. They actually said that the practice is different. Signing uh, some um, difficult to actually put this in practice and also uh, to internalize this instrument in Brazil. So uh, I questioned uh, in my research about this effectively internationalization, um, which is part of my conclusions. So uh, first, um, we actually see some difficulties on the generali generality of the policy since it's um, directed to all workers and to specific characteristics of domestic work, like, for example, the place that this is performed. Also, there is a no recognition of the house as a workplace, identifying the risks, for example, and actually uh, how uh, the workers are by themselves, right? Because um, it's very difficult to identify a place in where a lot of domestic workers are performing at the same time. So there is an isolation of them. Uh, also, Brazilian national workers have policy can be identified as a political strategy for the promotion of this work because of its connection um, with the agenda, with the national plans, and also with the unique conference that happened. But uh, I actually question if is there any alignment with the normative strategy to promote decent work especially the convention number 109. And when I did find that the instrument is not actually internalized by them, I could um, discard this, this hypothesis of my study. And at the end, uh, I couldn't find that decent work is not a reality for domestic workers in Brazil. So these are my main references. And I thank you for your attention and the opportunity. Thank you so much, Katharina. Our next presenter is Wanisha Sukhdev from York University. Wanisha Sukhdev is a lawyer and course director at Osgood Hall Law School. Uh, she completed an LLM at Osgood before starting her PhD. Um, Wanisha, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. So the topic of my talk today is weather and work, how climate change relates to workers' rights. And um, I focus on uh, precarious workers. This is a new research project that I'm in, starting just, just now. And so it's, it's still in its early stages. So bear with me and I welcome feedback on how you think the project is best, um, how it should best proceed. So the fight against climate change is multifaceted, right? As it involves transcending borders, involves many different stakeholders. We can think about the fact that huge multinational corporations and the pollution they cause throughout the world, this is not limited by you know, the borders of Canada or the United States of America. So how do we get international law to factor in when we think about climate change and workers' rights? So workers who complete their work obligations in the outdoors will be impacted by climate change in the most severe manner as the increase in extreme weather will make what was originally dangerous work, if you think of construction workers, it will make it even more dangerous. 
and um, extreme temperatures, not just excessive heat. And we see that in British Columbia, there was a, a heat dome a few summers ago where many people lost their lives. I think it was about 400 people. So extreme heat, and we know in Canada, extreme cold. So how can we actually combat this? And so the fight against climate change, and then how can we ensure that workers are safe when they are working in these dangerous um, workplaces? As well, the tragic death of a 24-year-old UPS driver from suspected heat stroke makes this issue more urgent and dire. Workers are not just facing, as I said, these usual, or as the slide says, usual threats and dangers of outside work, inherently dangerous, but now this increased chance of actually dying on the job due to heat and heat-related issues. So we can think about workers who are working outdoors, they are not the only ones impacted, but they are the ones who are going to be the most impacted, right? Again, delivery drivers who tend to be, you know, in precarious work situations, uh, construction workers, these people who work outdoors, that's just inherently part of their job. We can also think about office workers, that the commute to and from the office, the heating and cooling systems are going to have to change to make sure that if workers are actually in the workplace, that there is um, an appropriate uh, temperature in the workplace. So what is the role of international law? And as the slide states, right, as weather will bring more heat domes, flooding, wildfires to Canada, there must be government action taken that recognizes this unique position uh, that workers face in relation to climate change, right? These issues, as I said, are not limited by national borders. Climate change is an international issue. So how can we get the Canadian government to work alongside other governments to make sure that not just as I said, the fight against climate change, but how do we ensure that workers who already were working in dangerous conditions are protected? How do we increase protections for what are sometimes termed like um, outside workers or, or workers who are uh, working outdoors? So in relation to this problem, we also have to think about who is most impacted. So women are particularly impacted by these issues. We can think about climate refugees. We see the devastation done in Pakistan and other parts of the world, forcing people to leave their homes and their country. This tends to be along gender and racial lines. We can also think about the impact of poverty, that you know, who is forced to move, who is forced to leave their home, who is forced to leave their country, it tends to be along similar lines throughout the world, right? That women um, being the most impacted. So I, I plan to argue in the work that new worker protections must be codified into law. And we also have to look at extra legal mechanisms before climate change makes work life even more hazardous, right? How do we move from thinking of kind of um, what is often termed a soft law approach where corporations have voluntary standards that they adhere to. Sometimes they make those standards themselves, uh, what we would call like self-regulation. And how do we make sure it goes from just merely voluntary to actually mandatory where corporations are forced to or compelled to by law ensure that their workers are actually being protected or the workers who work for the corporation, not necessarily their workers. So look at the current laws in Ontario and there is an obligation right now. Uh, employers have a duty under section 25 uh, sub two sub H of the Occupational Health and Safety Act to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of a worker. So this includes developing hot and cold environment uh, policies and procedures to protect workers in both hot and cold climates. So any worker who is working in extreme heat or extreme cold, um, we can think about working in extreme heat and how this puts stress on a person's cooling system. So when heat is combined with these other stresses, such as hard physical work, um, loss of fluids, fatigue, or some medical conditions, imagine if someone already had asthma or diabetes, the stress on their bodies that they encounter in extreme heat, how that is different from someone who doesn't have those uh, conditions. So this may lead to heat related illness, uh, disability, and even death in some circumstances. So anybody working in extreme heat may face these risks. In Ontario, heat stress is usually concerned during the summer. 
Um, this is especially true early in the season. So they say the government on their website talks about uh, the fact that you're not used to the heat. Your body is still transitioning. And as we know, in Ontario, we go from anywhere of like plus 40 degrees to minus 40. So the human body has to adapt to those differences in temperature. And um, that, that is really difficult to do, the government stating, at the beginning of the season. And um, it's important to understand the symptoms and take preventative measures against heat related stresses in order to function effectively in such conditions. Again, you can think about the worker who is kind of stuck in a um, delivery truck. Are they drinking enough fluids to combat potential heat stroke? You can think about those vehicles that don't have doors. So they're, it's, it's basically impossible to have air conditioning in such a vehicle. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, they need to have um, air conditioning in the vehicle and that will prevent heat stroke or heat related illness. We have to think about how to reconfigure these vehicles. How do we actually protect workers in kind of their existing conditions, right? It's, it would be impossible to say or be very unlikely that, oh, well, these workers are going to drive around in air conditioned vehicles. That's not the actuality. That's not what's happening in real life. So how do we protect them in their current real life situations rather than thinking about, I think, ideals? It's important to keep in mind um, what is aspirational versus what is achievable. How do we protect workers in a vehicle that has no doors? How do we actually deal with this situation um, in the current time? I also looked at corporate governance and stakeholders. Um, my research overall looks at corporate governance and how we can use the mechanisms of the corporation to help protect workers. And so in this context, looking at the Canada Business Corporations Act, section 122 of the act, which deals with director's duties. So someone who sits on a board of directors for a corporation, they have certain obligations under the law, which can be found both in the language of the legislation, the CBCA, as well as at common law, like in the case law itself. And so in 2019, there were amendments to the CBCA that um, included a list of stakeholders. This is codifying language from an earlier, from a decision in 2008 from the Supreme Court of Canada, where the court in that situation said, that the obligation of directors, if you're sitting on a board of directors, is not just to focus on the interest of your shareholders. Because in corporate law, we say shareholders are the true owners of the corporation. So how can the directors kind of serve to make sure that shareholders are becoming more wealthy or their interests are being considered and to the exclusion of all other stakeholders? And now the law says, well, sometimes there is a reason to think about other stakeholders beyond shareholders. And that was a 2008 decision BCE. And then we see the amendments in 2019. So 11 years later that we see this uh, codification of BCE. So originally section 122 talks about every director and officer of a corporation and exercising their powers and discharging their duties shall a act honestly and in good faith with the view to the best interest of the corporation and exercise the care diligence and skill that a reasonably prudent person would exercise in comparable circumstances so that aspect of best interests of the corporation was once read as synonymous like corporation read as synonymous with shareholders and then we see this um amendment. So then under that kind of uh, marginal note of best interests of the corporation, subsection 1.1, when acting with a view to the best interests of the corporation under paragraph sub 1 sub a, the directors and officers of the corporation may consider but are not limited to the following factors. And I think I have an extra slide here. Um, so uh, subsection 1.1 states the interest of shareholders, employees, retirees, pensioners, creditors, consumers, and governments sets apart the environment and long-term interests of the corporation. So we can see that employees are included in this list of stakeholders, but then the law gets complicated as to who counts as an employee right? That specific language of employee as opposed to worker, does that only mean full-time employees of the corporation? Does that include part-time uh, employees? Does that include precarious workers? What is the full extent of that term? What is the complete definition, which is not offered in the legislation itself? So I'm mindful of the times. So I'm going to try to uh, move past. Um, I think I've already taken 10 minutes. 
So I talk about consumers in relation to climate change and workers. So the issue here um, that I want to actually, I, I would love questions about related to both of these issues when you think about the fight against climate change and the drive to protect workers, can you think about ethical consumption and minimalism, right? So ethical consumption is, the, is used to describe the phenomenon of consumers choosing products and services based on the ethics behind, right? Like where is a product sourced? Where is it manufactured? We think about blood diamonds and sweatshops, right? All these considerations that the ethical consumer keeps in mind when making purchases. And so then what is minimalism? Well, it means living with the things that you really need, right? Removing anything that distracts us from living with intentionality and freedom. So what is the role of the consumer in helping these workers, right? If you take this argument to the absurd, I say here, if no one ordered anything then UP, using UPS, then the problem would go away. So is it almost... Um, are consumers complicit in this problem? That is it the overconsumption of consumers that is forcing drivers on the road, delivery drivers, right? UPS and, and um, uh, you know, Canada Post, not just to pick on UPS, but to think about all these delivery trucks, Amazon being a big one, um, constantly on the road, is that to satisfy the overconsumption of consumers? And what is the role of consumers in that regard? Should they instead approach or embrace minimalism and think about how many items do you actually need to purchase? And so I'm going to wrap up there if anyone has any questions. And um, in my last slide there, yeah, just to, I did complete my PhD when I submitted um, for this conference. I had not defended yet, but I now have defended. So just for full disclosure there.